But for the past three weeks, we've been on this series uh, entitled Make War, and it's kind of went uh, side and side with um, Brother Brian's series that he's doing uh, with UFC. And we're talking a lot about spiritual warfare. And, you know, I think it's really cool. I was telling some guys the other night, we were hanging out, and I was telling some of them, I said, you know, uh, I was talking to one of my buddies who's a pastor in Colorado, and they are actually doing a series right now talking about making war and spiritual warfare. So it's obviously something that's very important and something that you all need to know about. But tonight, um, I, I just, I really, I was going to stretch it out for a little bit, and I just really didn't feel in my spirit that's what we need to do. And God kind of spoke something different into us. And so we've got a, a little bit of a, a just a, a different stuff going to be going on for the next uh, month or so. But uh, what, what he spoke to me tonight is something called wasted. Say wasted. Wasted. Have you all ever known of anything that's been wasted? Now, have any of you all ever been... Never mind, don't answer that. And uh, have you ever wasted your life? Have you? Have you wasted things in your life that God intended for you to have for good, and instead you used them for bad? Anybody been there? How many of you tonight, maybe you got something on your plate of food and you didn't like it, so you just threw it away? Anybody do that in here? Okay. Anybody do it at lunch today? I know the school serves some good food, guys. Come on now. All right. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So you had to throw something away. Have, have any of you ever had anything that's maybe broke on you or messed up on you and you ended up, instead of just trying to fix it, you just got rid of it? Anybody? Ever? Okay. All right. I've done the same thing. It's just not even worth the time to fool with it, so you just throw it away and go get a new one or just do without, right? I want you to think about this. What if God did that to us? What if every time we broke and every time we messed up, God just got rid of us? How many of us in here would be in the garbage? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much a mess, right? But thank God our God recycles. He likes to take something that's old and done, and he likes to make it new. And what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to create something in your life that is so much better, and his intent is so much better, but only if you allow him to work in you and through you will it ever get there. Because most of us that are in this room, and most of us that go to school each and every day, and most of the houses in this town, and, and, and every church that's in this community, and every nation in this world, we can all say that we have something in common, and it's wasting something in our life. Now, I had an old woman just a couple of weeks ago. I go to, uh, I go to uh, Bluegrass Way and do a devotion twice a month. And I really do. I like it. In all honesty, I enjoy uh, our older generation, our older people. I, I like sitting and talking with them. And I, I guess I grew up around old people when I was young, and so that I've just got a heart for them. But I had this old woman, dude. Like, she went off on me. Like, I thought she was going to – she was yelling at me so loud. I thought her dentures were going to slap me in the face. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Like, she was so mad because she couldn't hear me. And she's like, why can't I hear you? And I'm used to working with you guys, so I wanted to be like, because you're not listening. But I didn't. I was like, ma'am, you know, you're getting a little bit older, and the older you get, you tend to lose something called hearing. You know, but she was mad. I mean, she was irate. And she made this statement, and, and I want to use it tonight. She goes, you shouldn't let anything go to waste. And what she was talking about is, she thought I was wasting my time, and she was wasting hers because she couldn't hear me. Now, the weird thing was, she couldn't hear me, but she could hear the vacuum cleaner. I'm like, what in the world is going on with this woman? But she, to her, we were wasting our time. What are you in your life right now wasting that God is trying to give you, teach you, show you, provide for you, but yet you are wasting it? You're giving it away. It's like you don't even care. But at the entire time, God is sitting there. He's trying to show you something. He's trying to, to lead you to a new spot. He's trying to bring something up in your life. But you can't get there because you won't focus on it enough. How many of you all uh, have been privileged enough to be a part of what's going on here at Elkhorn for at least two or three years? Okay? All right. So for the ones of you that's been here for the past two or three years, you've seen how we've went through the stages of growth here at this church and how we've been blessed. We've been blessed on Wednesday night ministries. In fact, a little, over, uh, a little over a year ago, right before I took the job, 
Uh, we were running about 64 on Wednesday nights, and tonight we did a count, and alone there's 120 students, and that doesn't even, uh, that doesn't even add in with the staff and stuff that's here tonight. Amen. Now, that's not, I, I don't say that to, for me to take glory. I, I'm saying that's what we are a part of, what God is doing. But did you know that for this church to be able and for anybody to be able to get to the next level, that you have to go through what we like to call around here a little bit of hell in the hallway. You know what I'm saying? Anybody know what I'm saying? See, to get somewhere you've never been before, you've got to do something you've never done before. That's a good word, ain't it, Donnie Bird? Sound like that quote at lunch, don't it? Yeah, I got that from Donnie. All right. But check this out. You do. You, you've got to be able to, to go to a new measure. And some of you, it's right in front of you, and God is speaking to you, and He is trying to reveal something to you, whether it's His love for the very first time because He desires a relationship with you, or maybe He's calling you into something, or maybe He's wanting to help grow you, or maybe He's trying to show you something in your life, but you're missing out on it because you are so selfish. Now you're wasting your life. What a sad thing it is to know we waste our life. If you would, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 14. This is Luke 14, and we're going to start in verse 25. Luke 14, starting in 25, and this is what it says. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said. Now, this is Jesus speaking. All right, this is not Daniel. I didn't come up with this. This is what Jesus said. He says, if anyone comes to me, Jesus, and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me, what's it say? Cannot be my disciple. Now, for the past three, four weeks, even for the, really, even when we were into the series of making the team, I've really been hounding home, guys, listen, I've really been trying to hound home how important it is that if you say that you're a Christian, your life should reflect it. In fact, everything that you say, everything that you do, the people that you hang around, the music that you listen to, should be a reflection of the glory and of Jesus Christ that is in your heart. And obviously, if there's no reflection there, there's no fruit there, there's no relationship there. Last week, we talked about uh, a spirit, remember? And if the Spirit of God is in you, then you have the Spirit of God. But if it's not, you don't. Everybody remember that? Well, this week, it's the same thing. God puts it, and this is a little bit earlier on. This is actually Jesus when he was ministering here on the earth. This is actually him speaking. And he says, Tony, he says, if you want to be one of my followers, you have to hate your mother, hate your father, your brother and your sister, even life itself to follow me. Now, how many of you all in here hate? Oh, y'all, you know there are more haters up in here than that. Who's hating? See, the thing is, we be tossing around the word love all the time. I love this. I love that. Oh, girl, I love you. Uh-huh. All this love. And then we toss around the word hate. It's like, oh, man, I hate that. I hate that. That's stupid. Oh, you know, we be talking like that and stuff. We hate everything. And so then all of a sudden, we get to a point in our lives to where we've got hate coming out of our mouth and we've got love coming out of our mouth. And really, there's no difference because we say it so loosely that there, there's, there's absolutely no difference in the two words. So when you say you hate something, do you really hate it? What, what's hate really mean? What's it mean? Dislike, okay. That's a, that's a pretty soft version, definition of it. Nick, what is it? Okay. Murder? Dislike? Okay, you wish harm upon somebody? What is it? Don't like it at all. There you go, that's pretty simple. I like that version. What is it? What's hate? Who's hating? Oh, y'all know you'd be hating. Ask you this at school. Say, girl, what, what boy done took y'all's, or what girl done took y'all's boyfriend? Y'all be like, 
oh, man, they hating on me. Y'all tell me all this big story and stuff, right? Y'all can't even tell me who hate is. All right. What, what's hate? Anger. Okay. All right. What else? Can't stand somebody? Jealousy. Okay. John? Come from the devil. All right. There you go. All right. Well, if we have hate in our lives... Then we are to take somebody and say, we're done with it, right? Now, do you hang out with people you hate? Who just said, yeah? <laughs> Sydney said, I don't care. I just got to hang out with whoever I hang out with me. You know, it's what it is. All right, so, so y'all hang out with people you hate? I don't. If I don't like you, I ain't going to be around you. I just tell you. If you smell funky... Jesus loves you, but I, you know, no, I'm cool. I'm cool with you. But, but anyway, if, if I don't like somebody, I'm not going to be around them. So here's the deal. Jesus says you're to hate, stay with me, you are to hate your mother and your father. Let me ask you something. Stay with me. You're to hate your brother and your sister. And you're to hate life itself. So with the definitions, guys, listen, that you all just gave me for hate, how many of you all in here tonight can say that you hate your life? And you hate your parents? And you hate your brother and sister? I'm not talking about being mad at, ticked off at, a little bit of problem going on. I'm talking you straight up hate it. Now can I teach you something? Say, you. Yeah. Are y'all awake up in here? Yeah. All right, well, let me teach you something. Let me put it in fine language. Because if y'all anything like me, if you read something like that out of the Bible, you're like, did Jesus really want us to hate that? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know, I, man, I love little sweet old ladies in the church. They come up and they're like, well, do y'all really need this? You know, you know how they are. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's how y'all are. Y'all, did Jesus really want us to hate? You think he does? He said it. He, he said hate. What's it say, Chris? Anyone who loves their father or their mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves, and, and just to paraphrase, anybody who loves anything more than me is not worthy of me. They do not belong to me. So here's the deal. I'm going to put it in simple language for you tonight. And I want you to see how many of you all may fit in this category. Are you ready? Luke 14, 26. And it says, anyone who does not hate. You want me to tell you what this means right here? Anyone who is not willing to give something up. Now, I asked you earlier about things in your life that you've come across, whether it's a food or an electronic or whatever it is, and maybe you just get tired of it or it breaks or something messes up. And what do you typically do? Unless you're a hoarder, you get rid of it, okay? Most of the time, you get rid of the stuff. Now, we've got things that rise up in our life, and we're going to get rid of them. But thank God that Jesus doesn't treat us the same way. Thank goodness he comes into us and he says, you know, he says, I want something good for them. I have something better for them. So I want to ask you tonight, what is it that is in your life that you are holding on to that is keeping you from being all that you can be for the kingdom of God? Who in here is holding on to Facebook and an Xbox and all these electronics and iPhones more than you are God? Now, you don't have to show me. I wouldn't be raising my hand. I'd be embarrassed that I was hanging on to this stuff. How many people in here, you're holding on to stuff like lust and sex and drugs and alcohol? You're, you're more worried about how you stand and your popularity and what a girl or what a guy thinks about you. You're more worried about the, the statue that you have and whether people read you or not, what they think about you, how manly or how, how girly you may be. You're, you're worried about what the world thinks. And so you're holding on to that. And in, in, in essence, what you're doing is you are making that an idol. And so in all reality, when Jesus Christ says that we are to hate it, He doesn't mean necessarily hate our parents. 
It's exactly what Christian says. We have to put them below him. Now, I've preached on idols before. And we've talked about idols before and how so many times we idolize things in our lives. But how many of us in here tonight, you can honestly say there's something in your life that you are idolizing and putting before God? You don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to think about it. How many of you in here, you're more worried about the love in your life than you are Jesus? How many of you in here are more worried about where your heart beats at? You see, because the Bible tells us that wherever, uh, wherever a man spends his time, his heart's there with it. So what does your heart beat? What keeps you ticking? Are you spending more time worrying about a relationship and all these little friends and the schoolwork and the clubs and the sports and, and all the stuff on the Internet? Or are you more worried about things with God? Because, guys, let me tell you something. I'm going to speak straight up with you. I always do. And let me tell you something. How many of y'all up in here got relationship problems? Raise your hand. How many of you all in here got something going on with a problem with your parents? Problems at school? Problems with anything else? How many of y'all got problems with your problems? You know what I'm talking about? I get problems with my problems. I tell you, one come up, another one slap me in the face. I'm like, good day. All right, check this out. You want me to tell you why we have problems? You want me to tell you, Johnny, why relationships are failing, why marriages are failing, and why churches are not able to grow and rise up in what God's called them? You want me to tell you? It's this. We're not hating it and choosing Jesus. You're more worried about what she thinks and what he thinks no wonder you can't get focused and in the presence of God. You're not going to be able to until you drop it. I told a young man just a couple of weeks ago. He said, everything's falling apart. And I said, it's going to until you get right with God. And don't think it's going to stop. Eh? It's just going to keep on coming. It is. Because God wants our attention. He wants all of us. He don't want half of us. don't want one quarter of us. He wants every single bit of us. And he says that if we are sold out, that we truly belong to him, that he's got each and every bit of us, and he has control of us, and he can do something with us. But if we don't give up to him, we give in to the world, that we've just got a little bit of the world and a little bit over here. And I was going to show you guys an illustration tonight on the, on the computer. I really, really liked it. And I, just, I found it late, and I didn't really have time to get it to Aaron or to do anything with it, so we ended up just... just Forgetting it and wiping it out and everything, okay? But here, here's, what, here's what it was. It showed this guy, and I'm not going to lie. He was a lot like me. He was a kind of chubby feller. And so anyway, it showed him. He's dressed up, and he wore his tie too short. You know what I'm talking about? Like tie's supposed to come down here, and his tie's up here look goofy. But anyway, all right, so check this out. So he comes in, they're interviewing him, and he's at one church, and he goes, oh, yeah. He says, I go to St. Augustine first thing in the morning because they got muffins. And the Bible says, ask and you shall receive. So I went and got me a muffin because I asked for it and I just took it. You know what I'm saying? And so then I went over to so-and-so church because they got a coffee that I like. In fact, it's Starbucks. And so he went and got Starbucks. And he said, then I come back to so-and-so Baptist church and I go there for the service. And then I leave there and I go over here to the Methodist church and I take communion. And then I leave there and I go across the street to the Pentecostal church to the, annual, or the, the weekly potluck that they have. And then I leave there and I go back to the Bible study because it makes me feel good. And you think, what does that have to do? You know, that's, that's exactly us. We are so worried about pleasing ourselves and if we feel good, and if we look good, and if everything's good with us, we don't have to worry about anything. But the first sign of trouble, the first thing that comes up in our lives, who do we seek out for? Jesus! Don't we? Jesus. God, where are you? Lord, I don't understand. I've been praying. Oh, really? When was the last time? Well, Lord, I'm faithful to church. Yeah, but do you go to go or do you go to learn? See, there's a little bit of a difference. Well, God, and we make all these excuses, and the whole time God's saying, you know what? I don't even know who you're talking to. I don't know why you're talking to me because you ain't talked to me before. I don't even know you. And in fact, he tells us that if we don't have a relationship with him, one day he will say, depart from me. For I never knew you. Now, I don't know about you guys, 
But I think about the man who created this universe, and if he wants to make a mountain rise up out of this floor, he can. That kind of that kind of scares me just a little bit, you know. I don't know about you guys. I'm kind of like, woo, because if God, the Creator of the universe, can do that, and I mess up, oh, Spencer, I don't want to play that game. And so, what is it in our lives that we're holding on to and not hating? We're keeping our focus on it instead of God. So the first thing God says that Jesus tells us that we have to do to be a true follower of him. So how many followers in this house? Now I've been really hitting on the followers. I'm trying to get you guys straight. That's it? That's probably about right. Because I guarantee if I went to school, there'd be about that many who actually got a good witness going on. All right, check this out. He says the first thing you got to do is exactly what I've been talking about. Is this. He says you've got to give it up. When he says hate... He says, give it up. Give up your mother and your father. Give up your brother and your sister and give up your life. Because Orin, it's not about what you want. It's not about what you need. It's all about what he wants for you and what he's going to do through you. And you see, when you have a full, total surrender to him, you watch what he does. But so many of us, we, we grasp onto these things and we'll never let go. And so therefore, he can't work. And the second thing is this. Luke 14, 27. I'm going to move fast. You guys stay with me. Luke 14, 27, it says, anyone, I'm paraphrase for you, anyone who does not carry their cross. Now, what does the cross mean? What does the cross represent right here? The what? No, it's not the Bible. It's not death. The cross is a sign of death, but what does it mean right here? Is the cross a good thing? The cross is a good thing? I mean, if I see a cross, I'm like, oh, boy, you know, backstepping it and everything. The cross is not good. And so what the cross is representing in here right now, tonight, is those bad things that rise up in your life, and yet you claim to be a believer, and you claim to be a Christian, but when the first thing surfaces, you run from God. How many people in here right now, and you don't have to raise your hands, how many people in here, at some point in time, you've heard this discussion? Come on in here. Sit down. Me and your mom... Or we're getting a divorce. How many people in here have lost somebody you loved? Yeah. How many people in here know somebody who's not a Christian and their life is absolutely miserable? Yeah. See, we have these things and when they rise up in our lives, instead of Nathan calling on God, we get mad and we run. But he says to take up your cross and follow him. And what that spoke to me whenever I was reading it is he says, Daniel, no matter what hell may rise against you, because guys, don't, don't think that I don't have hell in the hallway. I, I fought hell yesterday. I did. People want to run their mouth? Bring it on. Because God spoke to me then, and he spoke to me today, and he said, Daniel, take up that cross and follow me. Forget about what everybody else says, what everybody else thinks. You know where you are, and you know where I've planted you. So you come. I said, all right. And he's telling you the exact same thing. Guys, it doesn't matter if right now you're in, your parents are going through a divorce, and you know about it, if you're hurt by a divorce, if you've been abused, if you're depressed, if you're suicidal. It doesn't matter if you're addicted to pornography or drugs or alcohol, or you just started smoking, trying to fit in and act like you're cool, but in fact you're getting lung cancer and you're going to die a whole lot earlier. Yeah, it don't matter. None of that matters. All of it is, is Jesus has something for you, and he doesn't want you to give up. So, Gary, that's why he says, take up your cross and follow me, because he wants to see that you're faithful. Now, how many people in this room tonight, you consider yourself faithful to God? You're faithful? So, if keep your hands up. Keep your hands Don't put them down. I like, I like asking other questions, and everybody's like, oh. So I, if I go around the room, you can honestly, in front of God, in front of me, in front of all this group, all of you got your hands up, I'd say, you spend daily time in God's Word reading. Like, I'm not talking like, for God so loved the Word, He gave His only begotten Son, to whosoever die, believes in Him, shall not perish, have every last life. Oh, okay, I got to go. I'm talking, you spending some time. Okay, all right. You spending time praying, worshiping, a little alone time. Okay. That's good. Congratulations. I'm glad you guys are. For the rest of you, what's the deal? For the ones of you that didn't raise your hand, don't you claim to be a follower? Do you? 
Who didn't raise their hand but yet you claim to be a follower? You can say, my life's not where it is, but I claim to be a follower. What's the deal? What's the hold up? See, God puts it pretty simple. He puts it pretty simple. He said, there's two things you got to do. First of all, you got to give up stuff that you may not like. And the second thing you've got to do is you no matter what, no matter what hell may come against you, whatever may rise up against you, you've got to pick it up and follow me and stay faithful to me. And if you'll do that, you are a follower of mine. Don't leave me when things get bad. Uh Uh-uh. Because he never left us. So why are we going to leave him? Are you with me? If you are, say I am. How many of you guys ever heard the country song, Find Out Who Your Friends Are? Anybody ever heard that? What if God had a song that said, Find Out Who Your Followers Are? I thought about that this evening. I know it's kind of corny, but man, I was thinking about that, and I was like, you know, I wonder what that'd be like. They're like, find out who your followers are. You know what I'm <laughs> Y'all don't think I can sing? No. I, knew, I used to be a worship leader before I was a youth pastor. No, I'm just kidding. I was a liar, though. No, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. I, I know I can't sing, but the Bible says make a joyful noise, and joy comes from the heart. It doesn't say beautiful noise, because God knows I couldn't sing at all then, but but check this out. I was, I was thinking about that. I said, you know, what if he had a song that said, find out who his true followers are? Would you be on that list? If he had a list of names, who his followers were, and I stood up here on stage and I started reading them off, how embarrassed would you be when your name wasn't read? Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, just walks up here and he starts saying, all right, this is for an example, okay? Stand up. You're one of my followers. You're one of my followers. Nathan, your life's not really matching up to it. Sorry. Would, would you be embarrassed? Uh, just for an example, I'm not saying Nathan's life's like that, but would you, you'd be embarrassed, right? I know I would be. I'd be like, no, man, God, my name's on that list somewhere. You know it's on there, right? See, because if you're not saying that now, you're going to say it sometime. Guys, y'all can sit down. If you're not saying it now, you can say it sometime because eventually you will be called into the, into the judgment room. And when you stand before judgment, he's going to call out your name. And he's going to let you know if he knew you or if he didn't. So what are you going to say when he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. Oh, but God, I'm on that list. I went to church. I was a good person. Man, I talked to a guy this week. He said, Oh, I'm a good person. I said, hey, you know Jesus. He said, well, I'm a good person. I read the Bible and I go to church. I said, well, glory be to God. So does Satan. It does. How do you know that if you die right now, student, how do you know, young man, how do you know, young lady, that if you die right now, that you're going to heaven? I'm going to ask JT to come up. Tori, whoever, Chris, y'all come up and just play something soft for me. I want you guys to stay with me. Don't, listen, don't get focused on them. Don't get focused on them. Stay with me. It's a very vital time right now. How many of you all in here right now would be able to die and go to heaven? And it's a whole lot more than just saying I'm a good person. That's not going to cut it. Can I tell you something else? Good works don't cut it. Following the Ten Commandments don't cut it. Knowing the Bible don't cut it. Being a good person, doing stuff for somebody, that's not going to cut it. Coming to church, knowing Scripture, knowing that Jesus exists. Woo, whoop dee. That's not going to cut it. And this is, this is raw and this is in your face, but guys, this is the problem with the church and the world today. We're trying to tippy-toe around everybody to keep from offending them when the whole time people are dying and going to hell. So I want to let you know in here tonight that there is only one way to enter the kingdom of heaven, and that is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There has to be a time in your life that you realize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And you have to fall on your face and say, you know what, God? I am so messed up. I got some junk in my trunk, and there's a lot of stuff holding me back. But I'm ready to get it right. And I'm ready to live for you because I'm tired of running from my problems. And I know, God, that you told me in the Bible that if I'm a real believer, that I'm going to live for you. And if I'm not, obviously I'm not going to live for you. And when you come to that point in your life and when you get real with God and you call on Him and you ask Him to save you and you really mean it, He will save you. But just sitting here saying, Jesus Christ, come into my heart and save me, doesn't save you any more than anything. See, you have to mean that prayer.
You have to mean it. Everything that you say, you, you have to mean it. Cody, can I use you real quick just for an example? Is that cool? Come here. I want you to put your hands on this music stand and don't let go. Okay? Whatever you do, do not let go because this is your life. This is your life. And don't let go of it. Okay? You got it? It's a cool life, ain't it? Now, this is the best I got. This is, this is nothing big, okay? This is nothing even in the comparison to what Jesus Christ offers us. But this is a, uh, an iTunes gift card, okay? I'm just doing this for an illustration. Hold on to that life, Cody. But I've got an iTunes gift card here. It's free. You just got to come get it. Now, which one do you want? Do you want your life or do you want this card? Because you can choose. If you want to let go, you can. I'm telling you, if you want to let go, you can. If you want this card, then come get this card. It's yours. You're going to hold on to that life? You're going to keep holding on. I'm offering you a free $10 iTunes gift card. Free. It's all yours. You want it? You want to keep holding on. You don't want to let go. I'm offering you a free card. And you refuse to let go. For real? You rejecting this. For that? So you're going to pack this everywhere you go now. Right? Do you want this card? You don't want a free gift? Man, can I tell you that there's a gift that God is offering to you. But many of you all are just like Cody. And you're holding on to this podium. You're holding on to your life when God is sitting here trying to give you a free one. Father God, Lord, with every head bowed, every eye closed, Lord, I pray that you would continue to move in this place. And God, I pray with nobody looking around, with nobody whispering, nobody texting, nobody talking. Lord, I just pray that people would examine their hearts. And Lord, just seek your face right now. Because God, I know out of a crowd of 120 students, that Lord, there's got to be somebody in this room who does not know you as Savior and Lord. And so God, I pray that right now, if they do not have a relationship with you, that, Lord, that you would convict them like you've never convicted them before. And that, Lord, that they would know. God, that they would cry out to you, Lord. That they would stop running and they would stop fighting and they would stop trying to be everything that they're not. And that they would let go. God, please, Lord, we beg of you. We cry out to you right now, Lord, to do a mighty work. Lord, just do something mighty in this place and save somebody's soul right now. I want nobody looking around. Everybody still get your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Please be respectful of this time. I want you to be honest with me. Now listen, let me explain something to you. Your head's still bowed, your eyes still closed. Let me explain something to you, okay? This is very simple. This is nothing huge. You only need to be saved once. If you truly meant the prayer you prayed and you've been saved and you've been baptized, then you're good to go. Now, sometimes as a Christian, sin can creep back in and take over. And you may need to get it right with God and ask for forgiveness again. That doesn't resave you. You only need to be saved once. Okay? So don't play that, don't play that card. But if you're in here tonight and you've never made that decision to follow Him, or you know that when you did, that it wasn't real, and you know that the relationship you have is void, I want nobody looking around, nobody whispering, nobody talking, nobody playing footsie or anything else, and I want you, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, and you were to die right now, and you know without a shadow of a doubt, you would split hell wide open, 
and you know that, would you just do me a favor? Just right where you are, I want you to just lift up your hand for me and just keep holding it up for me just for a minute. Is there anybody in this room that you know you've never made that decision before and if you were to die, you'd bust hell wide open because the decision you made was void and it wasn't real? Anybody in this room? If you feel that way, just lift your hand straight up. Nobody looking around. Leaders, I want you guys to look around and just see who it is that you need to pray for. And I want you to pick somebody out and just pray for them right now that they would get it right tonight. All right, you guys can put your hands down. Thank you. Everybody still heads bowed, eyes closed just for another minute, guys. I want to ask you something, and I want to be very real with you. I love you, and my heartbeat is you guys. I don't do what I do for this church. I don't do what I do for a deacon. I don't do what I do for Brian or Haywood. I do what I do for you guys. And I want you to know that your staff that's here and myself, we love you. And we want to see you grow deeper and closer with God than ever before. But the only way you can do that is to make sure your life is right. So if you're in here tonight and you are a Christian, but you know that your life is a mess and you're doing exactly what Cody did and you're holding on to that life and you're not letting go, and your life is a mess and you want to get rid of it, I'm going to ask you to just start praying and ask God to do a work in your life. And you can either do it in your seat or you can do it down here at this altar. This altar is open and it always is. But I'm asking you, if that's the way and you need to pray and you want it to be in the altar, to come right now. Come to this altar and begin to pray. If you want to do it in your seat, do it in your seat. Nobody looks around. Everybody's head still bowed. Every eye closed. Just let God love on you for a minute. Let's go. If you need to pray, move. If you need to do something, do it. Let's go. Don't wait. Because I dare say that everybody in this room has their life right with Christ. If you need to pray, pray. Don't pray because somebody else is praying. You pray because you need it. If you need that Jesus tonight, if you need help tonight, if you want him to do something in your life he's never done before, then you seek his face. If not, you sit still. out on it. If God's calling you, don't sit there. I was a pew hugger for a long time. I'd grab a hold of it and I'd never let go. And the whole time God was calling me, saying, Daniel, Daniel, if you were to die right now, where would you go? Do you know for a fact that you'd spend an eternity in heaven? And finally one night I said, you know, God, I really don't know. And in 1998, good day, some of y'all weren't even born. 1998, I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart as my Savior, Lord. Now, am I perfect? No. I'm still a mess, and i still got stuff in my life that I have to work out daily. But the thing is, is I know that if I were to drop dead right here preaching the Word of God, that I would enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not because I was a good person, not because I help people, not because I, I know God's God. It's because I have a relationship with Him. Do you? Do you?